Your taxable account can be one of the most difficult accounts to invest correctly. It's often thought of as a leaky bucket because every time you make a change or you receive a dividend, it's a taxable event. This in turn hampers growth. In today's video, I wanna lay out a three-part framework that can help guide you to making better taxable account decisions. Let's first jump into why it's so important to focus on taxes and stay tax efficient when investing in this type of account. On the screen, I have growth of a $100,000 account growing at 8.5% per year. In the green column, I have an investment that has no tax strikes, meaning that this is an investment that doesn't pay you a dividend and you don't sell this investment in the given time horizons I'm about to show. In orange, I have an investment that you buy and hold, but this investment pays a 3.5% dividend. Then in red, I have an investment that basically has a 10% turnover each year, meaning maybe this is a portfolio of investments that grows at 8.5% per year, but then you change up or rebalance 10% of that account each and every year. Now, the first thing that you'll notice is there's a gap in value between the investment with no tax drags and the other two options shown here. With a taxable account, anytime a dividend is paid or you turn over part of your account to reinvest in something else, there is a taxable event. Anytime taxes are paid, it basically means you're reinvesting less because you have to take money out to so pay those taxes. And thus you're hurting compounding. This is why the idea of asset location is so important. You wanna make sure you are putting the right investments in the right accounts that leads to the most tax efficiency or the most after-tax value across your situation. If you're gonna hold a high dividend stock or fund, you want that located in tax-protected accounts like IRAs, not your taxable account. And so here's the general problem at hand that we are going to provide some insight into in this video. There's a good chance that right now your taxable account might not be invested as tax efficiently as it could be. But does it make sense for you to make changes right now? Making changes today means you're taking a tax hit today. So how do we navigate taking a tax hit today to improve our situation over the long term? Well, first, there might be a number of reasons you want to make changes inside of your taxable account. You may be looking at lowering or eliminating tax drags as one of those main objectives. You may also have an investment that has simply been underperforming and you're looking to upgrade it to a better performing investment. In this video, we'll also touch on making an adjustment if you have the wrong investment structure inside of your taxable account, basically comparing ETFs versus mutual funds. And then you can see a number of other reasons shown as well. Now, quick disclaimer before getting into this framework. As we dig into this concept, we are gonna be forced into some complexity. There's no way to avoid this. Both compounding math and the US tax system can lead to complicated calculations. I'm gonna to try to simplify this as much as possible and constantly zoom out to summarize the thing that you should take away from some of the case studies that we're going to walk through. But to start out, let's first dive into this framework. There are three things that we need to consider broadly when making a change within our taxable account. Number one, we need to focus on what is the tax rate or tax cost we are paying today to exit a given investment, to upgrade it. Number two, what benefit are we expecting to receive from upgrading our investment? And how much time do we have to realize that ongoing benefit? And then finally, what is going to be the use of that money in the future? And what tax rate will we be paying because of it? Is this money that will be used for retirement? Or is this money that will be passed on to the next generation and receive a step up in basis when you pass that money on? As we adjust each of these variables, know that the conclusion will change slightly. But rather than talking in complete theoretical terms, let's walk through an example. Let's say that we currently have a $100,000 investment within our taxable account. Let's say we are currently invested in a more dividend-oriented fund with a 3.5% dividend yield. Let's also say we're going to compare this to exiting this dividend fund and investing in a lower dividend yielding fund like a growth stock fund. For the sake of this analysis, we're gonna say that the growth in both scenarios is gonna be the same, 8.5% per year. So the only difference between these two investments is the level of tax drags due to dividends. Right now, the cost basis of this investment within the example we're gonna use is $80,000. We're using a 15% tax rate anytime there is a taxable event. So if option A is exiting our current investment for a more tax efficient investment, we're gonna to have to take a tax hit today that will cost us $3,000 in value. This means we're basically reinvesting less than if we would have otherwise just stayed in our current investment. 
So the question at hand then is how long do we have to stay invested before the benefits of the ongoing tax efficiency overcome the cost that we would incur at the start? Well, it would take until year eight until we found the overall value, the value we see on our statement of upgrading will surpass the value of basically staying where we're at. This break even matters, but is only one of the break evens we need to consider. For instance, at the end of the day, we really care about after tax value. If you pass away and pass this money on to your kids, they will receive a step up in basis, which means the overall value, the value you see on your statement, will be the after tax value because all of the unrealized gains or tax liability due to the unrealized gains is eliminated with a step up in basis. But if you are planning on using this investment during your life, then there will be a later tax cost of exiting each investment, which will be the difference between the value and the cost basis. Now we see in this context, the break even doesn't happen until year 15. So zooming out, what does this mean? If this is the situation you're facing, if the money in your taxable account is meant for the next generation, your break even will be much closer. If this money is meant for you to use later in retirement, if you plan on using this money within the next 15 years, you should actually keep your investments in the more less efficient structure. If your money will be used beyond the next 15 years, then it might be worth exiting your current investment and investing more tax efficiently. But here's the thing. Although there are some complexities to this simplified example, this is still fairly simplified. In many situations, your tax rate will not stay static at, let's say, a 15% tax rate. If you are performing things like Roth conversions, the tax rate on your taxable account might grow for a period of time. Then when you are completely done with Roth conversions, you might be in lower brackets and you may pay 0% at some points. So let's try to look at the same situation, but let's add a few more complexities. Let's say this investor is performing Roth conversions for eight years at the start of their retirement in order to minimize future tax liabilities due to things like RMDs. Because of this, they're going to be pushing their capital gains rate up into an 18.8% .8 zone rather than 15%. I have this highlighted in red. All of their variables from the simplified example are essentially the same. So what's really happening behind the scenes here? Well, the cost of tax inefficiency on an ongoing basis will be higher because of the tax rate they would be paying, the higher tax rate they would be paying, I should say, during those eight years. This will move the break evens up significantly. Now we see the step up in basis break even moved up from year eight to year six. We then see the after tax break even moved up from year 15 all the way up to year nine. So whether we should make a change or not depends on the use of those funds and the time horizon that we have. Going back to the structure of this three-part framework, there's a broad takeaway that we can already pull out. This entire framework really comes down to minimizing tax hits we will ultimately have throughout our life. If we look at our investments today, a big variable in this process will be the tax hit that we are forced to pay today in order to upgrade our investments. The bigger the unrealized gains that we currently have in that underlying investment, the bigger the tax cost will be. The bigger the tax cost today, the more that we need to see in annual benefits from the switch or the more time that we need to recoup those benefits. Now, this insight might lead someone to say, okay, so if I have a low cost basis relative to the current value of my investments, I'm probably better off never making a change, right? And this would be the wrong insight. Let me explain. Thus far, we've really just focused on the difference in dividend yields or tax drags, if you will. But there are far more reasons that you might want to adjust investments in your taxable account as we showed earlier. Let's compare investing in an index fund ETF and let's compare this to actively managed mutual funds. Now, to keep everything as simple as possible, I'm going to use two large cap growth mutual funds Fidelity's famous Contra Fund and American Fund's famous Growth Fund of America. And let's map the returns of these funds over the last 15-ish years against this index fund. We see that performance is highly correlated as the ups and downs in each investment look fairly similar, which makes complete sense. All of these funds are invested in large cap growth oriented investments. But the performance, as we see, is obviously quite a bit different between these three funds. And this is because of two things. Number one, fees. The actively managed mutual funds have higher fees. And then number two, most funds over a long period of time underperform the index or benchmark. In both cases, the underperformance is about 1% per year plus. But this isn't the only difference. The investment structure between an ETF and mutual fund will also differ the tax efficiency on an ongoing basis. ETFs are generally more tax efficient, where mutual funds are passed through entities. 
which means the mutual fund manager is buying and selling investments and the tax consequences of that buying and selling is passed along to you, the investor. Now, know that an index mutual fund will be quite similar to an index ETF. Most of the time, we won't see a lot of buying and selling, and so we'll see both being fairly tax efficient. But when we compare it to an actively managed mutual fund, the gap grows quite wide. Fidelity Contra Fund, since 2019, has released forced distributions of about 8.5% per year. The Growth Fund of America has had over 7.5% forced distributions since 2014. Now, what is a forced distribution? Well, let's say you had $100,000 invested in Growth Fund of America. If the forced distribution on average has been 7.5%, well, that means you have $7,500 of additional taxable income from that fund. You have no control over this. And this can get really inefficient over time. So we're going to see multiple levels or avenues of potential improvement. First, there is a performance difference that really can't be ignored. Now, is this performance difference guaranteed? Well, obviously not. An active mutual fund could certainly have a good run and outperform an index for a period of time. But again, data shows that over a long stretch of time, most funds greatly underperform their benchmark. Second, there's a big difference in tax efficiency, as we've already discussed. Big force distributions like we show will make a massive difference in how much you're actually able to keep from your investment growth. So let's go back to our break-even analysis. We're going to assume a 1% difference in performance between the index fund and actively managed mutual funds. We are also going to assume that the mutual funds force an additional 7% distribution on an ongoing basis as well, in addition to the dividend yields. And in this example, we're going to use a larger cost on the front end from exiting our current investment and assume a cost basis of 50% rather than just uh, 80% as we showed before. Tax rate is 15% in all cases. Now, where do the break-evens fall? Well, the after-tax break-even happens after the first year. Effectively, the performance difference is making the biggest difference here. The step up in basis break-even happens a few years later in year five. So I really use this example to show how big an effect of annual improvement can actually have. Even if we are taking a much bigger tax hit initially, the annual improvement is large enough that it doesn't take nearly as much time to recoup the cost that we would have taken on the front end. Now, as we make decisions within our taxable account, you'll notice that three different columns of values matter here. This is why I included each of these three columns in every table that I showed. We care about the overall value of our investments in the context of passing money on to the next generation. Otherwise, it's largely a vanity metric. It's just what shows up on our statements, but it's not what we could actually take from that account and live on. If we are using that money ourselves for our retirement, we care about what the after-tax value will be, which is a function of the difference between the current investment value and the cost basis of that given investment. Depending on the goals that you have for that money inside of your taxable account, you should be focusing on a different column or different metric. Now, my main goal with this presentation is to show you what should actually go into your decision-making process when you consider making changes in your taxable account. If you're a DIY investor, you should be able to put together a fairly simple spreadsheet like the ones that I've showed in order to make some of these more optimal decisions. If you're working with an advisor, they should be going through some similar calculation process when they recommend you make a change or recommend you don't make a change, whether that's in front of you or behind the scenes. Now, the map here is not the territory. We don't know what the exact growth rate per year will be of one investment versus another. Our goal with this analysis is not to have some perfect calculation. That's impossible. But a calculator that is 80% of the way there is far better than simply naive guesses where we're just picking a decision out of a hat. Hopefully this helped increase your understanding of how to manage your taxable account properly. Now we've covered a lot of ground here and often this information sinks in only with repetitions. If you're looking for more insight on how to manage your taxable account properly, click this video right here where I talk about five taxable account rules that will lead to more tax efficiency in your retirement. Click this video to learn more. And always remember, you don't need more money. You need a better plan. Look forward to seeing you in the next video.